Good evening, everyone. This is Dale Vandersand. I'm your reader tonight from the Merchant's House Museum for Warmth from the Hearth, 19th Century Stories for the Season of Light, 19th Century Holiday Stories for the Season of Light. Uh, welcome back. Tonight is the last reading of this series. We've had quite a few, and I thank you for joining with me. Um, if you have not joined us before, the other stories are available. The videos for the stories are available on Facebook as well as on our YouTube channel for The Merchant's House. You can go to merchantshouse.org or merchantshouse.org slash calendar for all the events at The Merchant's House. There you will also see the links to these stories. Um, so welcome. Tonight we'll be re reading various things, some letters and one particular story. Uh, the first story we'll, we'll read is Mirama's Christmas Test by Timothy Thomas Fortune. And then we'll have a letter by Samuel Clemens, who is better known as Mark Twain, to his daughter. And we'll also have uh, another father-daughter letter from um, Howells, uh, William Dean Howells, called Christmas Every Day. And finally, we will end with uh, Virginia O'Hanlon's reply from uh, Francis Church in the New York Sun, uh, which is the most famous of all. Merchant's House is located at 29 East 4th Street in Manhattan in New York City. It's a row house that was built in 1832 and one family, the Treadwells, lived there for almost 100 years. So the house is furnished with their belongings. Uh, we have their furniture, their uh, uh, clothing, things like that. Um, it's a wonderful little time capsule in the middle of Manhattan. Uh, do check it out at the website. And also we've had some good news. There's been some threat to the museum uh, by the way of uh, developers next door in the, in the lot next door that wanted to build a hotel. It's not so much that they want to build a hotel, that's the problem, but any kind of construction of that order would most likely damage the very, very uh, uh, precious plaster work that is in the parlors, especially, uh, and also the Port Dora marble fireplaces, things that are irreplaceable, especially because this was only one family who lived there. So the story of the merchant's house uh, needs to remain intact, as well as the house does remain intact since 1830, the 1830s. Um, although when you walk in, it's mostly around 1855 that you will experience, um, which is when the Treadwells and the neighborhood, the Bond Street area was most alive and uh, vital as the most prominent neighborhood and address of New York City at the time. Tonight's stories, let us begin with uh, Mirama's Christmas test. Uh, I, this can be found in a wonderful, really uh, unique treasury, well, treasury of uh, African-American Christmas tales. Um, I, probably the only one of its kind by Betty Thomas Collier. And uh, this story is from 1895. So uh, let us enjoy this. I'm sure very few of you have heard it, although I know that they have uh, put this on stage in certain areas. Uh, there's a theater in New Jersey down further down south that does put this, um, make, makes it into a play. So maybe you'll be lucky enough to find that someday as well. So here we go. Narama's Christmas Test by Timothy Thomas Fortune. It was Christmas Eve and there was but little frost in the air, but it was frosty enough to make people move along briskly as they stirred about Jason, Florida, the land of sunshine and flowers, of mockingbirds and alligators, getting together Christmas things for both the little ones and the big ones. Also, for it is very true, as the poet has said, we're but children of a larger growth. Some of the larger ones are bigger children than the small ones. This is just what Marama Young thought as she sat near Alexander Simpson in the neat parlor of her own home in the upper part of Jason and watched the big logs in the fireplace blaze and hiss. Marama Young was angry. These two young people were up-to-date Afro-Americans with positive views on most subjects and with good-sized tempers with which to back them up. 
They both taught school. Mr. Simpson taught for a living, but had no sort of love for the work. It seemed to him more dignified to teach school than to follow the trade of a carpenter, the mastery of which he had acquired in his youth and for which he had a real aptitude. His supreme ambition was to be a lawyer with political influence and all that. He even dreamed that someday he might be commissioned by the president as minister, resident, and consul general near the court of Faraway, a soft snap much sought after by ambitious men of his race. Marama taught school because she liked it and because she was intensely devoted to her race and its best interests. She had a good home and had graduated from a famous seminary at the head of her class. Her father was a builder and contractor, one of the old timers who hired his time before the war and had been hiring the time of other people ever since. He was a practical old gentleman and thought there was nothing that nothing was too good for Marama, his only child. Marama was engaged to be married to Alexander Simpson. They had reached an agreement on that point, but there were others necessary to the fulfillment of their mutual pledges upon which they were still as far apart as the North and South. They were argumentative and dogmatic, were Marama and Alexander, in their discussions. There was nothing of the spoiled child about Marama. But for a so, so small a woman, she had enough will force for three women. When she put up her small foot, when she put her small foot down, Alexander Simpson could not make her take it up, although he weighed almost twice as much as she did. This was very painful to Mr. Alexander Simpson, who was entirely devoted to Marama and twice as sentimental as she, and not half as studious in burning the midnight oil. Indeed, Mr. Alexander Simpson did not possess a literary head, although he thought that he did. Marama had come out of school at the head of her class. Alexander had come out at the foot of his. And during the year that she had taught under him in the city school, she had upheld the discipline and the dignity of the work at the school. Mr. Alexander Simpson was a fine mathematician and somewhat of an architect. He had learned the carpenter's trade in his youth, and his father hoped that with a college education, he would become a master carpenter and builder. His father died just as Alexander finished his college course, and as he had a great many irons in the fire at the time of his death, there wasn't much left for Alexander and his mother when all the creditors were satisfied. Now, if Alexander had been a wise young man, he would have taken up his father's business where his father left off. If he had done so, he could have saved much of his father's business and property. But Alexander Simpson was not going to bother with the carpentering business, not if Alexander knew himself. He did not think it proper, a sort of business for a young man with a college education. Any sort of a common man could be a carpenter, he thought, but any sort of a common man could not be a lawyer. And just here it was that Marama Young and Alexander Simpson differed and so radically that Marama had put her little foot down and Mr. Alexander Simpson could not budge it. They had been fighting it over for the hundredth time this Christmas Eve and had reached a point where silence had fallen upon them like a wet blanket. Marama was immovable. Alexander was stubborn. I have reached the conclusion that we'd better break off our engagement, Mr. Simpson said Marama, gloomingly staring into the fire. But you can't back out now, Marama. You have gone too far for that. Oh, yes, I can, snapped Marama. It is never too late to back out when you find that you have made a mistake. But have you made a mistake? Certainly. That is the reason I think it is best to break the engagement. What is the mistake? asked Alexander meekly. What is it? Why, you are as stubborn as I am, and that I give away to you as much as you do to me. Now, Marama, be reasonable. You know that you are as stubborn as I am, and that I give away to you as much as you do to me. That is just it, exclaimed Marama. Neither of us gives away. One of us must give away. You don't expect me to do it, do you? Alexander did not know how to answer this question, so evaded it by asking another. You don't love me a bit, do you now? You know I do, Marama said reproachfully. But you are so stupid.
stubborn. Now, what am I most stubborn in? asked Alexander soothingly. Everything, said Marama, with a sweep of her arm. Everything. You would provoke a saint. Taking a long pause, she said, Now take this law scheme of yours. Don't, said Alexander. We can't agree on that. If we can't agree on that, we shall not be able to agree on anything, and we had better not get married, and I won't marry you. So there. Marama had put her little foot down. Alexander argued and coaxed, but he made no headway. He was in despair. Things had never reached this stage before, and a compromise of some sort must be reached. What do you want me to do, said the strong man desperately. What do I want you to do, asked Marama indignantly. I've told you a hundred times. I want you to give up the idea of reading law, and I want you to stop teaching school, and I want you to go with my father in the carpenter business. You will never succeed in the law, and you don't like school teaching, and you know all about carpentering. My father wants you to help him. He's getting old and can't attend to all his business, and I am not going to marry you unless you do what I want you to do in this matter. Alexander had studied the question from a thousand points of view, and he had reached the conclusion that the law was the business and life he wanted to follow, and that the carpentering business was not his idea of dignity. What did he, what did he get a college education for? Just to be a carpenter? Not much. You needn't say another word, said Marama. I will not budge an inch. The business that was good enough for your father and that is good enough for mine is good enough for you. You couldn't make enough money as a lawyer to support me, and you know it. Oh, I don't think I know anything of the sort, exclaimed Alexander. Well, perhaps you don't, Marama said dryly, but I do, and I am not going to try the experiment. We don't need to argue the question anymore. Mr. Alexander Simpson did not argue the question anymore. He put on his thinking cap and kept it on in dead silence for 10 minutes. Then a big spasm of pain passed over his face, and Mr. Alexander Simpson, for the first time in their courtship, surrendered. I have been trying to get you to fix the marriage day for a year. Now, if I do what you want, will you fix the date? Certainly, said Mirama. I will fix the day any time you say after you write your resignation to the school board. That is your Christmas test, said Mirama Young. Alexander took his fountain pen and, securing a sheet of paper, wrote his resignation to the school board to take effect at the end of the holidays and handed it to Mirama. She read it through carefully and said, We'll fix the date of the wedding. Tomorrow at three o'clock, said Alexander. Oh, that is a Christmas test, exclaimed Mirama. Yes, Mirama's Christmas test, said Alexander Simpson. I hope you find it as sweet as a story as I do. Um, it could take place at any other time at Christmas, but uh, the fact that it is a Christmas tale also shows that it's a gift to each other. Their stubbornness gives way, and um, so they will have a happy life, or at least I'm sure they'll fight the rest of their lives, but happily and satisfactorily. Um, tonight's stories all center around gifts and giving, and that's why I thought I'd put all these together tonight. The next story I'd like to read, actually, is by Mark Twain. Uh, this is a letter, actually, not so much a story. Uh, it's a letter to his daughter regarding Santa Claus. Palace of St. Nicholas in the moon, Christmas morning. My dear Susie Clemens, I have received and read all the letters which you and your little sister have written me by the hand of your mother and your nurses. I have also read those which you little people have written me with your own hands. 
For although you did not use any characters that are in grown people's alphabet, you use the characters that all children in all lands on earth and in the twinkling stars use. And as all my subjects in the moon are children and use no character but that, you will easily understand that I can read your and your baby sister's jagged and fantastic marks without any trouble at all. But I had trouble with those letters which you dictated through your mother and the nurses, for I am a foreigner and cannot read English writing well. You will find that I made no mistakes about the things which you and the baby ordered in your own letters. I went down your chimney at midnight when you were asleep and delivered them all myself and kissed both of you too, because you are good children, well-trained, nice-mannered, and about the most obedient little people I ever saw. But in the letter which you dictated, there were some words which I could not make out for certain, and one or two small orders which I could not fill because we ran out of stock. Our last lot of kitchen furniture for dolls has just gone to a very poor little child in the North Star, away up in the cold country, above the Big Dipper. Your mama can show you that star, and you will say, Little Snowflake, for that is the child's name, I'm glad you got that furniture, for you need it more than I. That is, you must write that with your own hand, and Snowflake will write you an answer. If you only spoke it, she wouldn't hear you. Make your letter light and thin, for the distance is great, and the postage very heavy. There was a word or two in your mama's letter, which I couldn't be certain of. I took it to be a trunk full of doll's clothes. Is that it? I will call at your kitchen door about nine o'clock this morning to inquire. But I must not see anybody, and I must not speak to anybody but you. When the kitchen doorbell rings, George must be blindfolded and sent to open the door. Then he must go back to the dining room or the china closet and take the cook with him. You must tell George he must walk on tiptoe and not speak. Otherwise, he will die some day. Then you must go up to the nursery and stand on a chair or the nurse's bed and put your car to the speaking tube, put your ear to the speaking tube that leads down to the kitchen. And when I whistle through, it must speak in the tube and say, Welcome, Santa Claus. Then I will ask whether it was a trunk you ordered or not. If you say it was, I shall ask you what color you want the trunk to be. Your mama will help you name a nice color, and then you must tell me every single thing in detail which you want the trunk to contain. Then when I say goodbye and a Merry Christmas to my little Susie Clemens, you must say goodbye, good old Santa Claus. I thank you very much, and please tell that little snowflake I will look at her star tonight, and she must look down here. I will be right in the West Bay window, and every fine night I will look at her star and say, I know somebody up there and like her too. Then you must go down into the library and make George close all the doors that open into the main hall, and everybody must keep still for a little while. I will go to the moon and get those things, and in a few minutes I will come down the chimney that belongs to the fireplace that is in the hall. If it is a trunk you want, because I couldn't get such a thing as a trunk down the nursery chimney, you know. Well, people may talk if they want until they hear my footsteps in the hall. Then you tell them to keep quiet a little while till I go back up the chimney. Maybe you will not hear my footsteps at all. So you may go now and then and peep through the dining room doors. And by and by, you will see that thing which you want right under the piano in the drawing room, for I shall put it there. If I should leave any snow in the hall, you must tell George to sweep it into the fireplace, for I haven't time to do such things. George must not use a broom but a rag, else he will die some day. You must watch George and not let him run into danger. If my boot should leave a stain on the marble, George must not wholly stone it away. Leave it there always in memory of my visit, and whenever you look at it or show it to anybody, you must let it remind you to be a good little girl. Whenever you are naughty and some day and somebody points to that mark which your good old Santa Claus's boot made on the marble, what will you say, little sweetheart? Goodbye for a few minutes till I come down to the world and ring the kitchen doorbell. Your loving Santa Claus, whom people sometimes call the man in the moon. 
very Mark Twain. <laughs> um, I wonder if he ever intended that story to get out. Perhaps knowing him, he did. But uh, here is a story that was published called Christmas Every Day by William Dean Howells, also a father to his daughter. The little girl came into her papa's study, as she always did Saturday morning before breakfast, and asked for a story. He tried to beg off that morning, for he was very busy, but she would not let him. So he began. Well, once there was a little pig. She stopped him at the word. She said she had heard the little pig stories till she was perfectly sick of them. Well, what kind of story shall I tell then? About Christmas. It's getting to be the season. Well... Her papa roused himself. Then I'll tell you about the little girl that wanted it Christmas every day in the year. How would you like that? First rate, said the little girl, and she nestled into comfortable shape in his lap, ready for listening. Well, very well then, this little pig. Oh, what are you pounding me for? Because you said little pig instead of little girl. I should like to know what's the difference between a little pig and a little girl that wanted it Christmas every day. Papa, said the little girl warningly. At this, her papa began to tell the story. Once there was a little girl who liked Christmas so much that she wanted it to be Christmas every day in the year. And as soon as Thanksgiving was over, she began to send postcards to the old Christmas fairy to ask if she mightn't have it. But the old fairy never answered. And after a while, the little girl found out that the fairy wouldn't notice anything but real letters sealed outside with a monogram, or your initial anyway. So then she began to send letters, and just the day before Christmas, she got a letter from the fairy saying she might have it Christmas every day for a year, and then they would see about having it longer. The little girl was excited already, preparing for the old-fashioned once-a-year Christmas that was coming the next day. So... She resolved to keep the fairy's promise to herself and surprise everybody with it as it kept coming true, but then it slipped out of her mind altogether. She had a splendid Christmas. She went to bed early so as to let Santa Claus fill the stockings, and in the morning she was up and the first of anybody and found hers all lumpy with packages of candy and oranges and grapes and rubber balls and all kinds of small presents. Then she waited until the rest of the family was up, and she burst into the library to look at the large presents laid out on the library table. Books, and boxes of stationery, and dolls, and little stoves, and dozens of hand handkerchiefs, and inkstands, and skates, and photograph frames, and boxes of watercolors, and dolls' houses, and the big Christmas tree lighted and standing in the middle. She had a splendid Christmas all day. She ate so much candy that she did not want any breakfast, and the whole forenoon the presents kept pouring in that had not been delivered the night before, and she went round giving the presents she had got for other people, and came home and ate turkey and cranberry for dinner, and plum pudding and nuts and raisins and oranges, and then went out and coasted and came in with a stomach ache crying, and her papa said he would see if his house was turned into that sort of a fool's paradise another year, and they had a light supper, and pretty early, everybody went to bed cross. The little girl slept very heavily and very late, but she wakened at last by the other children dancing around her bed with their stockings full of presents in their hands. Christmas, 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 they all shouted. Nonsense! It was Christmas yesterday, said the little girl, rubbing her eyes sleepily. Her brothers and sisters just laughed. We don't know about that. It's Christmas today, anyway. You come into the library and see. Then all at once it flashed on the little girl that the fairy was keeping her promise, and her year of Christmases was beginning. She was dreadfully sleepy, but she sprang up and darted into the library. There it was again, books and boxes of stationery and dolls and, and so on. There was the Christmas tree blazing away and the family picking out their presents and her father looking perfectly puzzled and her mother ready to cry. I'm sure I don't see how I'm to dispose of all these things, said her mother. And her father said it seemed to him they had had something like it just the day before. 
but he supposed he must have dreamt it. This struck the little girl as the best kind of a joke, and so she ate so much candy she didn't want any breakfast, and went round carrying presents, and had turkey and cranberry for dinner, and then went out and coasted and came in with a stomach ache, crying. Now the next day, it was the same thing all over again, but everybody getting crosser, and at the end of a week's time, so many people had lost their tempers that you could pick up lost tempers anywhere. They perfectly strewed about the ground. Even when people tried to recover their tempers, they usually got somebody else's, and it made the most dreadful mix. The little girl began to get frightened, keeping the secret all to herself. She wanted to tell her mother, but she didn't dare to, and she was ashamed to ask the fairy to take back her gift. It seemed ungrateful and ill-bred. So it went on and on, and it was Christmas on St. Valentine's Day and Washington's birthday just the same as any day, and it didn't skip even the 1st of April, though everything was counterfeit that day, and that was some little relief. After a while, turkeys got to be awfully scarce, selling for about $1,000 a piece. They got to passing off almost anything for turkeys, even half-grown hummingbirds. And cranberries, well, they asked a diamond apiece for cranberries. All the woods and orchards were cut down for Christmas trees. After a while, they had to make Christmas trees out of rags. But there were plenty of rags because people got so poor buying presents for one another that they couldn't get any new clothes, and they just wore their old ones to tatters. They got so poor that everybody had to go to the poorhouse, except the confectioners and the storekeepers and the booksellers, and they all got so rich and proud that they would hardly wait upon a person when he came to buy. It was perfectly shameful. After it had gone on for about three or four months, the little girl, whenever she came into the room in the morning and saw those great, ugly, lumpy stockings dangling at the fireplace and the disgusting presents around everywhere, used to sit down and burst out crying. In six months, she was perfectly exhausted. She couldn't even cry anymore. And how it was on the 4th of July. On the 4th of July, the first boy in the United States woke up and found out that his firecrackers and toy pistol and $2 collection of fireworks were nothing but sugar and candy painted up to look like fireworks. Before 10 o'clock, every boy in the United States discovered that his July 4th things had turned into Christmas things and was so mad. The 4th of July orations all turned into Christmas carols, and when anybody tried to read the Declaration of Independence, instead of saying, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary, he was sure to sing, God rest you merry, gentlemen. It was perfectly awful. About the beginning of October, the little girl took to sitting down on dolls wherever she found them. She hated the sight of them so, and by Thanksgiving she just slammed her presents across the room. By that time, people didn't carry presents around nicely anymore. They flung them over the fence or through the window, and instead of taking great pains to write for dear papa or mama or brother or sister, they used to write, take it, you horrid old thing, and then go and bang it against the front door. Nearly everybody had built barns to hold their presents, but pretty soon the barns overflowed, and then they used to let them lie out in the rain or anywhere. Sometimes the police used to come and tell them to shovel their presents off the sidewalk or they would arrest them. Before Thanksgiving came, it had leaked out who had caused all these Christmases. The little girl had suffered so much that she had talked about it in her sleep. And after that, hardly anybody would play with her because if it had not been for her greediness, it wouldn't have happened. And now, when it came Thanksgiving, and she wanted them to go to church and have turkey and show their gratitude. They said that all the turkeys had been eaten for her old Christmas dinners, and if she would stop the Christmases, they would see about the gratitude. And the very next day, the little girl began sending letters to the Christmas fairy and then telegrams to stop it. But it didn't do any good. And then she got to calling at the fairy's house. But the girl that came to the door always said, Not at home engaged, or something like that, and so it went on till it came to the old once-a-year Christmas Eve. The little girl fell asleep, and when she woke up in the morning, 
She found it was all nothing but a dream, suggested the little girl. No, indeed, said her papa. It was all very bit tr every bit true. What did she find out then? Why, that it wasn't Christmas at last and wasn't ever going to be any more. Now it's time for breakfast. The little girl held her papa fast around the neck. You shan't go if you're going to leave it so. Well, how do you want it left? Christmas once a year. All right, said her papa, and he went on again. Well, with no Christmas ever again, there was the greatest rejoicing all over the country. People met together everywhere and kissed and cried for joy. Carts went around and gathered up all the candy and raisins and nuts and dumped them into the river, and it made the fish perfectly sick. And the whole United States, as far out as Alaska, was one blaze of bonfires where the children were burning up their presents of all kinds. They had the greatest time. The little girl went to thank the old fairy because she had stopped its being Christmas, and she said she hoped the fairy would keep her promise and see that Christmas never, never came again. Then the fairy frowned and said that now the little girl was behaving just as greedily as ever, and she'd better look out. This made the little girl think it all over carefully again, and she said she would be willing to have it Christmas about once in a thousand years. And then she said, a hundred. And then she said, ten. And at last, she got down to one. Then the fairy said that was the good old way that had pleased people ever since Christmas began, and she was agreed. Then the little girl said, what are your shoes made of? And the fairy said, leather. And the little girl said, bargains done forever, and skipped off and hippity hopped the whole way home. She was so glad. How will that do? asked the papa. First rate, said the little girl, but she hated to have the story stop and was rather sober. However, her mama put her head in at the door and asked her papa, are you never coming to breakfast? What have you been telling that child? Oh, just a tale with a moral. The little girl caught him around the neck again. We know. Don't you tell what, Papa? Don't you tell what? <laughs> I think it's my favorite of the bunch of them. However, now we come to Virginia O'Hanlon, uh, who lives in my neighborhood, or lived in my neighborhood, at 95th Street here in Manhattan. Um, and this, of course, we all know the famous story, and there have been many retellings and cartoons and uh, various Christmas movies about this tale, all from a simple couple lines of a question that an eight-year-old girl posed to um, the editor of the New York Sun, a very prominent newspaper in the day. And uh, she was encouraged by her father to do so. So that's how it came to be. Uh, so here we go. Dear editor, I am eight years old. Some of my little friends say there is no Santa Claus. Papa says if you see it in the sun, it's so. Please tell me the truth. Is there a Santa Claus? Virginia O'Hanlon, 115 West 95th Street. Virginia, your little friends are wrong. They have been affected by the skepticism of a skeptical age. They do not believe except they see. They think that nothing can be which is not comprehensible by their little minds. All minds, Virginia, whether they be men's or children's, are little. In this great universe of ours, man is a mere insect, an ant in his intellect, as compared with the boundless world about him, as measured by the intelligence capable of grasping the whole of truth and knowledge. Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. He exists as certainly as love and generosity and devotion exist. And you know that they abound and give to your life its highest beauty and joy. Alas, how dreary would be the world if there were no Santa Claus. It would be as dreary as if there were no Virginias. There would be no childlike faith then, no poetry, no romance to make tolerable this existence. 
we should have no enjoyment except in sense and sight. The eternal light with which childhood fills the world would be extinguished. Not believe in Santa Claus? You might as well not believe in fairies. You might get your papa to hire men to watch in all the chimneys on Christmas Eve to catch Santa Claus. But even if they did not see Santa Claus coming down, what would that prove? Nobody sees Santa Claus, but that is no sign that there is no Santa Claus. The most real things in the world are those that neither children nor men can see. Did you ever see fairies dancing on the lawn? Of course not, but that's no proof that they are not there. Nobody can conceive or imagine all the wonders that are unseen and unseeable in the world. You may tear apart the baby's rattle and see what makes the noise inside, but there is a veil covering the unseen world which not the strongest man, nor even the united strength of all the strongest men that ever lived, could tear apart. Only faith, fancy, poetry, love, romance can push aside that curtain and view and picture the supernal beauty and glory beyond. Is it all real? Ah, Virginia, in all this world there is nothing else real and abiding. No Santa Claus. Thank God he lives, and he lives forever. A thousand years from now, Virginia, nay, ten times, ten thousand years from now, he will continue to make glad the heart of childhood. Truer Christmas words never spoken. Merry Christmas to everyone from the Merchant's House Museum. Uh, please do visit our website, merchantshouse.org. And if you're local or visiting New York City at any time, hopefully a whole lot in 2021, when we'll all be free to move about again, we hope and expect, come to the Merchant's House. We are open now, uh, believe on weekends only, but by reservation. Uh, information about that is available on the website too. The rest of the stories from this series, Warmth from the Hearth, can be found on our Facebook page, uh, which is at Merchant's House, and you can also find them at the Merchant's House YouTube page as well. So please join in um, and check out the other events that are happening for another few nights, two nights, tonight and tomorrow night. We have uh, John Kevin Jones doing his A Christmas Carol reading, which uses the Dickens script that Dickens used himself when taking it on the road and playing all 21 or 22 different characters. It's quite delightful, and this is the ninth season. So do put that on your calendar. Um, and we hope to see you soon. New Year's Day, there will also be a um, virtual tour of the Merchant's House uh, talking about the New Year's Day tradition, which was uh, actually a bigger event than Christmas in New York City back in the 19th century. So learn about that tradition as well with us. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Um, and may 2021 be blessed for us all. Good night.